Get ready for the storm. I am the storm. At the end of my video on Sui Koden 1 and 2, I said that I planned on covering the rest of the series. Now when I said that, I didn't intend for it to take me 9 months to get back around to Sui Koden. But then I got distracted by other games I wanted to cover, had a video I never expected in a million years to do well absolutely blow up, got completely overwhelmed by both that and the fallback to reality with the videos that followed, and then I finally got my own copy of Skies of Arcadia and obviously had to cover that one first. You should go watch that one after you're done here. It's got Sky Pirates. Before I took way too long to get back to it, my original plan was to cover the Soiko Gaiden duology before moving on to the PS2 era. At least try to cover these games in release order, you know? But after all that time, I feel like it would be kind of a screw to the audience to just cover a couple PS1 visual novels. That is 100% the only reason I decided to cover the main five games first and then the spin-offs. It has nothing to do with me being a dumbass who forgot to buy those two games. Don't let any text currently on screen tell you otherwise. Released in 2002 only for Japan and North America, I guess Konami had something against PAL territories? Oh dear. Sui Koden 3 is the last in the series to be overseen by creator Yoshitaka Murayama, who sadly passed away earlier this year. So in a way, and please excuse the incoming pun, this can be seen as the swan song of the classic Sui Koden games. I use air quotes there because... Well, let me put it this way. If you have 10 people play Sui Koden 3 and ask them what they thought, you'll get 11 different opinions. Some think of 3 as the pinnacle of the series and place it among the pantheon of the greatest RPGs on the PS2. While on the opposite end of the spectrum, you have those who think it's an utter disgrace to the series that POISONED OUR WATER SUPPLY, BURNED OUR CROPS, AND DELIVERED A PLAGUE UNTO OUR HOUSES! And of course, all of the opinions in between. Quick reminder that I've covered Final Fantasy VIII, and even that doesn't approach the fan divide over Sui Koden 3, which means that this whole video is going to feel like wading through an ocean of angry hornets no matter what my opinion is. What do you mean you don't agree with me? Do you know who you're dealing with? In contrast to the fan base, critics by and large adored this game, with the weakest reception coming from critics who were either big fans of the first two or worked for Edge magazine. Edge never liked anything that wasn't by Nintendo, Bungie, or Rockstar, though, so that's not saying much. As for my own thoughts on Sui Code N3, look, I'm not going to keep you in suspense the whole video on this. It's a noticeable step down from 2. Mind you, that was practically expected going in. Sui Code N2 is among the best RPGs on a platform drowning in great RPGs. Crafting a superior successor on the same system would have been a difficult enough challenge. However, the PS1's time in the sun had come to an end, and it was time for Little Brother to take a turn. So Murayama and his team had the unenviable task of not only following up on their opus, but needed to do so on brand new hardware, and this time in full 3D. The jump from PS1 to PS2 was more of a kick in the teeth than some developers had arrogantly assumed, resulting in lackluster entries that nearly killed franchises. The PS2 wasn't simply a PS1 with better graphics, it was its own beast. And moving a series like Sui Koden to 3D, not only do you have 108 different characters to recruit, but somewhere around 80 of them need to be playable, then remember that virtually zero assets from the first two games can be reused or repurposed, and you still need to cobble together an enemy roster, walk around NPCs, dungeons, and a world map. The lack of 3D experience also means that you likely won't be able to compress everything as efficiently as developers with plenty of 3D RPGs to their name could so you'll likely have to cut corners to save space. All of this is to say that it would have taken an act of God to make a game that was as good as, or even better than, Sui Koden 2 under these conditions. I knew that going in, and yet still couldn't help but be disappointed with the final result. Sui Koden 3 isn't a bad game by any measure, but, well, it's easier if I just explain the game already. Sui Koden 3 moves us west of the second game's setting of Dunin to the Grasslands a troubled region host to frequent conflict between the various tribes of Grassland and their neighbors, the Zexan Confederacy. All the while, the Holy Kingdom of Harmonia waits in the wings for the perfect moment to strike and claim the Grasslands for themselves. What makes Sui Koden 3 stand out immediately is that rather than the single-player character of the first two games, you're given control of three different characters through the Trinity Site system, ostensibly providing you with a perspective from all three sides. First up is Hugo, a member of the Karaya clan and son of their chief Lucia, who you might recall as a minor antagonist in Sui Koden 2. 
Though I admit that I'd rather be playing as Lucia, making the child of a previous antagonist one of the new heroes is an interesting choice. The series has always enjoyed adding nuances and shades of grey, so getting a better idea of exactly who the Karayans are is a welcome bit of world building. Hugo himself is the closest we have to a prototypical protagonist among the three PCs. At Hugo's side are his griffin Fubar, his surrogate little brother Scrappy-Doo, I mean Lulu, and possibly the greatest character in all of Sui Koden, Sergeant Joe. Whatever else I have to say about this game, know that I will be eternally grateful to Sui Koden 3 for providing me with a halberd-wielding, military-minded, food-loving, and in the manga adaptation I didn't have time to read, cigar-chomping, anthropomorphic duck. It gets even better when you imagine him being voiced by George C. Scott as General Patton. It is not in the file! That was from The Exorcist 3, but okay. Joe is probably the most developed of Hugo's supporting cast, often playing the voice of reason when Hugo's temper gets the better of him. It says a lot about the quality of this game's writing that I'm capable of taking the duck with the Technicolor combat uniform seriously. That's the magic of Sui Koden. Next up is Chris, the newest leader of the Zexan Knights who is both beloved and feared for her prowess on the battlefield. Though Chris herself isn't too keen on the fame or involvement in the corrupt dance of Zex and politics her position brings, and especially not the Silver Maiden nickname friend and foe alike seem intent on calling her. She's a fine character on her own who's let down by her supporting cast. The knights under her command are all different shades of bland. You've got the bland pretty one, the bland strong one, the bland elf archer one, the bland psycho one whose last name is literally Red Rum, the bland squire one, and the bland consigliere one with Super Saiyan 3 eyebrows. You're one ugly motherfucker. Not to mention that it felt like half their dialogue consisted of them fawning over Chris like she's Ebony Darkness Dementia Ravenway. If you don't know what I'm talking about, consider yourself lucky. So, the moments that could have been used for demonstrating anything else about their personalities was dedicated to cockfighting over who gets to fuck Chris. I suppose Percival, the bland pretty one, does get a brief moment to shine when he and Chris visit his hometown, but it isn't long before he's overshadowed by Nash, the player character from the Suiko Gaiden games. Son of a bitch, I knew I should have played those first. I feel like discussion of Nash's character would make more sense for when I cover the Suiko Gaiden games, so let's get to the final main player character, Godot. Godot heads up the 12th unit of Harmonia's Southern Frontier Defense Force. The SFDF function as a sort of deniable ops group for Harmonia, taking on the kind of jobs that would be politically inconvenient for the government or the actual army to get involved with. Godot himself seems to have been designed to be the polar opposite of your typical Sui Koden hero. Quiet, aloof, and always emanating an air of mystery. Yet deep down he seems to possess a hidden altruistic streak. Though it took a while before Godot truly became an interesting character for me, the band of misfits under his command helped carry the chapters before that point. You've got Godot's second-in-command Ace, a man with a woman in every port and the debt to match, Joker, a hard-drinking monk with a mysterious past, Queen, the closest thing the 12th unit has to a social butterfly and Joker's drinking buddy, and Jacques, the new kid who's just about as aloof as his crossbow is comically large. I don't know about you, but I'd watch this anime. Maybe not an all-time classic, but a fun 13-26 episoder to have on while I'm editing. They even come with their own comic relief rival squad! On top of the main three you'll play as throughout the game, there are three bonus selections that you can unlock. The simplest of these is running around the base as one of the dogs you can recruit. See other recruits' reactions to said doggo and take a few laps around the horse track. I cannot express the disappointment I felt when I realized this didn't involve the dog riding around on horseback. Then we have one that involves endgame spoilers, so I'll save my irritation at this one for later, which just leaves us with Thomas, who should have been the real protagonist. Thomas is the bastard son of a Zexan councilman and a woman from up north, meaning that this is the one time a guy had proof of his girlfriend up in Canada. After his mother's death, Thomas was sent to live with his father, only to be cruelly rejected by the man, who cares more for his political career and the impact the reveal of having an illegitimate child could pose for him. Rather than send Thomas packing back north, however, his father decides to gift him a white elephant of a crumbling castle drowning in debt. With the help of the eccentric castle staff, Thomas has to take the lemons he's been given and make lemonade. In all honesty, the two short chapters you have with Thomas, Sebastian, Cecily, Martha, Juan, Ike, Mudo, and Mr. Piccolo's unconscious body have nearly as much story and character development as the other three characters combined. 
Sure, some of the battles were stupid difficult because of the low level Thomas and everyone else start at, but I was extremely disappointed when I realized that completing his scenario didn't unlock the bonus option of making him the main main character at a certain point of the game. That should be all for the characters you'll spend the majority of your playtime with. It's about time to move on to the gameplay. If you need a refresher on Sui Code and Basics, go check out my video on the first two games and then come back. See? Sometimes I do remember to have it linked to one of my other videos in the top right. At least until YouTube changes where everything is located again and this becomes an outdated joke. Well, more outdated than most of the jokes on my videos. Must drill faster! Frankly, there are so few changes for the better when it comes to Sui Koden 3's gameplay that I'm not even sure how to format this part. The battle system has been mangled to hell and back, the overworld doesn't even exist anymore and has been replaced by a basic map, army battles are a total joke, you can count the number of times you aren't railroaded on party composition on one hand, and the difficulty has been cranked up to obscene degrees for no good reason. Where would you start? I figured you'd say the battle system, Gary. That's such a Gary move. But it's as good a place to start as any, I guess. This is one of the parts that I can totally understand where the divide between critics and fans came from. On a mechanical level, things work fine, and for as much as I dislike the changes, they hardly make for an unplayable experience. I can easily see how anyone introduced to the series with Sui Koden 3 would have zero issues with it. However, this isn't my first Sui Koden. I know what this series is actually capable of. For starters, you no longer control six party members. Oh, I know it looks like you still do, but you don't. Instead, you control three pairs, which means the number of actions you can choose each turn has been halved, as you can only choose one action for each pair to take. If you choose anything besides attack or defend, then only one of the pair will take that action while the other does a basic attack on the closest enemy. It's the first of many instances where Sui Koden 3 takes as much control away from the player as it can. This is our punishment for finally getting Griffins to only take up one party slot instead of two. If this was done to streamline the game for new players, then they did it in the most asinine way possible. No matter how you assemble your party, whenever it actually deigns to allow you to do so, that is, you'll always feel unable to utilize your party's abilities to their fullest. When even someone like me, who is probably the furthest from a min-maxer you can get, feels frustrated at being unable to build the party he wants, you fucked up somewhere along the way. The formation system has been rendered pretty useless too, since they decided to crib from the likes of Grandia and Skies of Arcadia. Having a front line and a back line is more than a little pointless when everyone just runs around the open field now, wouldn't you say? I suppose it does mean you no longer have to worry about the reach of a party member's weapon deciding where best to place them in a formation, yet when you remove an aspect of your game and replace it with nothing, it tends to leave a gaping wound in the gameplay. Like how pairs can only use items on each other during battle and no one else. Or how unite attacks may as well not exist for how rarely you're given the option to use anything but the party ordained upon thee by the almighty railroad. Or how the skill system... No wait, actually the skill system is pretty cool. Hey, there we go, there's a positive. In addition to the usual golden XP you'll earn at the end of each battle, you'll also earn skill points which you can spend in a trainer to improve your party's current skills or learn entirely new ones. This right here is the change that I will happily point to as a genuine improvement on the previous games. Not only does this give you greater customization over your party, but each party member has their own potential level related to each skill. No longer are you simply scanning the roster for who has the best magic stat and affixing the strongest runes in the game to them. Now they need to have the proper training and affinity for said magic before they can utilize it effectively, which helps provide some welcome mechanical differences in the massive roster of characters. Back to the changes I don't like, the difficulty spike. Ooh, I bruised my little piggy head bone. The first two games had their moments, sure, but they were never all that difficult to get through. Apparently, someone on the dev team didn't like that, as Sui Koden 3 contains an array of pain-in-my-ass encounters. This isn't just story battles or bosses, either. I'm talking about random encounters that will absolutely wreck your party just because the game was feeling particularly vindictive that day. Enemies will be dealing damage well over 100 when having a character in your party with 500 HP is something you won't see until the end game. Heaven help you if you die in a story battle, which you will, because it's back to the last save point followed by mashing the X button for all it's worth to get through the same dialogue you'd already read five minutes ago. Even more if it's an army battle. 
Ah, uh, army battles. After coming close to a solid imitation of strategy RPGs like Langrisser and Sui Koden 2, what we get instead is... The story mode from Budokai 2? Wow, you are just the grand central station of disappointment, aren't you? This cheap-ass map that had looked more at home on Newgrounds was seriously their idea of a next-generation take on the large-scale army battles of the first two games. At this point, why not just bring back the single-screen rock-paper-scissors format of the first one? From a mechanics standpoint, these battles just flat-out suck. They weren't all that special in Sui Koden 1 or 2, but 3 demonstrates exactly how haphazardly thrown together they could have been. Your units aren't even actual units of soldiers commanded by party members anymore. They're just parties of four that play out an even more streamlined version of the normal battle system. Now you don't get to pick anything beyond attack, defend, or retreat. Units will use runes whenever they feel like, attack whichever target they feel like, and deal completely unpredictable amounts of damage. At the same time, the enemy AI flips between being more brain dead than the average Green Bay Packers fan, and mercilessly going for the throat the first chance it gets like the average Green Bay Packers fan. Why would you draw that? Watch as the AI wastes moves in its limited movement pool on seemingly avoiding attacking you altogether, then lose anyways because this section is ridiculously hard, followed by having that loss compounded by the AI immediately making a beeline for you the next time out. This is made all the more aggravating by, once again, how rarely Sui Koden 3 will give you the opportunity to change your unit configurations. I think there were about three army battles in the entire game where I got to adjust anything. Because virtually every other army battle in the game is more a slightly playable story event than an actual strategy game. Hope you enjoy fleeing or holding out for X number of turns because that's all you'll be doing up until the final chapter. Then it briefly remembers it's a Sui Kodan game and army battles almost become fun for a bit. But the specter of that infernal railroading continued to loom over everything, constantly making me question if I was about to hit another moment where the game may as well just rip the controller out of my hands. Of course, the first two games had their moments of forcing the player to take certain characters along and messing with the composition they preferred, yet there, even if it could still be annoying, these segments felt like they were put in to keep the player from becoming too complacent with their party configuration, and most of the time you had the space remaining for your absolute favorites anyways. In comparison, Sui Koden 3 behaves more like a control freak DM. No, you can't take along that new party member you recruited. I already gave you the party member that my story needs. I'll let you use these recruits when I can trust you'll use them the way I intended. 30 hours. It took me nine main chapters, plus Thomas's two side chapters, totaling 30 fucking hours before I had access to a headquarters where I could swap out party members on a whim. It took so long that I legitimately forgot that I was supposed to change out party members at the tavern. It took that same 30 hours as well before I had access to fast travel, which makes traversing this tiny, sad map and the glorified hallways it calls locations take so much longer to traverse than it should. In total, it took me about 50 hours to finish Sui Koden 3. I'm pretty sure at least 20 of those were from the padding of having to cross the map one note at a time no matter what. I'm sure it seemed thus far as if there's nothing about Sui Koden 3 I really appreciate outside of the new skill system. Well then, let's get a bit more positive and talk presentation. Right at the start, Sui Koden 3 hits you with this awesome opening FMV that gets you hyped with its slick animation and 100% eargasm of an opening number performed by the Japanese equivalent of Anya, Hime Kami. I'm not usually big on New Age music, but this song, Transcending Love, sets the tone so perfectly that I felt grounded in the setting before even pressing the start button. The remainder of the game's music is similarly excellent, despite the fact that the original Sui Koden composer, Miki Higashino, didn't return for three. In her place is the queen of Castlevania music herself, Michiru Yamane, with help from Takashi Yoshida, who I couldn't find a picture of, so here's a guy from Dragon Gate with the same name and Masahiko Kimura, composer of both N64 Castlevania titles. Both men would go on to collaborate with Yamane again on Castlevania's Sorrow duology, Yoshida for Aria of Sorrow, and Kimura for Dawn of Sorrow. Well, if you're going to replace the woman responsible for not just the first two Sui Koden soundtracks, but those of the arcade versions of Gradius and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, pulling from the Castlevania sound team is the least you could do. 
When it comes to graphics, for an earlier PS2 title, I think this has held up pretty well. Finally getting my PS3 in a spot where I could easily record footage off it makes it look even better. Some areas can feel a bit more lifeless than I think the developers intended, but that was so common at the time that it's hardly a strike against Sui Koden 3 alone. Particularly when it's obvious the focus went into the character design. And when you've got 108 different characters in the player's roster, that's where I'd prefer the focus be at anyways. Regardless of your feelings towards Sui Koden 3 itself, you're bound to find at least a few favorites based on design alone. The biggest exception to this strong character design being with the Zexan Knights. While I credit the designers with keeping a military sense of uniformity to them, it does come at the cost of most of them coming across as the same model with a different head. There's a reason why Fiction prefers to give elites more unique armor or uniforms than the usual soldier. Another issue that cropped up for me was the discrepancy between the portrait art and the character models, particularly with the human characters. Put simply, the cutesy, edging-on-chibi aesthetic of the 3D models clashes harshly with Fumi Ishikawa's more serious and detailed portraits. On their own, both are perfectly fine. I love Ishikawa's art to begin with, and the 3D models themselves remind me of Skies of Arcadia, so no problem there. But when they're put together, they have that vibe of comparing the art style of an old game with its remake. Except instead, you shove the remake's portraits into the original version. Ugh. Sorry, I just had the horrible thought of someone doing that with Langrisser. <laughs> I eventually got used to it, but I would have preferred if they decided on an aesthetic instead of this weak attempt at meeting in the middle. When have we ever done that? We've never done it that way. Finally, we come to the story of Sui Koden 3. If you still plan on playing this game and you don't want anything spoiled for you, skip ahead to here for my conclusion. The first chapter for all three characters is framed around the impending peace agreement between Zexan and the Grasslanders. Hugo is sent off by his mother as an envoy to deliver a message to Zexan, Chris is to be the primary representative of Zexan at the peace summit, and Godot... Godot just sort of gets caught up in everything while an assignment from Harmonia to search the Grasslands for clues relating to the rumored return of the Firebringer, the coalition of Grassland warriors that fought Harmonia to a standstill 50 years ago. This being the first chapter and all, naturally things go tits up at the Peace Summit when the Lizard Clan unexpectedly attack the Zexan Knight's rear guard, with Karaya and the other clans soon joining in on the attack. Confused by this turn of events and trapped in enemy territory, Chris and her knights make a desperation ploy of attacking the Karayan's village in the hopes of making the Grasslander army pull back to defend their own homes. In spite of Chris's orders to only burn the homes and spare the civilians, Boris, the psycho one, does exactly what you'd expect a guy with the last name Redrum to do. He and his unit ride on ahead of the rest and butcher everyone they can. Already stunned by the carnage wrought by her own men, Chris is shocked further to discover her missing father's armor sitting outside a Karayan home. Enraged by what she presumes to be a trophy taken by one of their warriors, Chris, partially on instinct, partially out of blind anger, lashes out at the Karayan foolish enough to try and attack her. It's only when it's far too late that she realizes it was only a child, Lulu. With barely a clue as to what's going on, Hugo and his friends had escaped the Zexan capital while being pursued by the two knights who had been left behind when Chris headed off to the Peace Summit. Having been repeatedly rebuffed and belittled by Zexan nobility, Hugo returns home to see the woman who had killed so many of his clan in battle standing amidst the burning ruins of Karaya. Before Hugo or Sergeant Joe can restrain the boy, Lulu lunges at the silver-haired maiden, only to be struck down with a single blow. All Hugo can do is scream in anguish and clutch the lifeless body of his friend as the knights silently depart. The tragedy here is beautifully done. By having to play more than one perspective, the player knows that neither the Zexan knights nor the Grassland clans had any deceitful intentions going into the negotiations. Both legitimately wanted the fighting to end. Yet all it took was a single spark to light a raging inferno that took the lives of countless innocents. Sui Koden 3 wastes no time at all in portraying the senselessness of war and the beast it brings out in supposedly honorable men and women. Horrific mistakes that can never be taken back are made in the heat of the moment, perpetuating the endless cycle of hate. If the game had kept up this level of storytelling, I would have forgiven every single downgraded aspect of the gameplay. Sadly, rather than a tragic tale of moral greys amid a war that was never supposed to continue, Sui Koden 3 steadily slides into something far more generic. 
the cracks begin to form as far back as Godot's first chapter. Notice how I didn't include his part in my recap of that haymaker of an emotional gut punch? It's because his first chapter feels disconnected from Chris and Hugo's chapters. Godot and his crew are just sort of there for the initial part of the story. Borderline neutral observers who mostly get involved because they happen to be present when an attack occurs. From the audience's perspective, there's no real emotional investment in the conflict for Godot or any of the 12th unit. Later on, we learn that he does indeed have a damn good reason for caring, but that's not for another 10 to 20 hours. In the meantime, his story seems to be present mostly to hint towards the intentions of the main villain and his henchmen. Were it not for the great dynamic between Godot's party, especially once Isla joins up with them, the early part of his story would have been a slog and a half. Eventually, what seems to be part of a Harmonian conspiracy to restart the war between Zexan and the Grasslanders to weaken both sides for a prospective invasion, which would have been a far more interesting premise in my opinion, leads all three protagonists on a hunt for the Flame Champion, the semi-mythical leader of the Firebringer. Hugo because he wants the Flame Champion to save the Grasslands once again, Chris because of a lead to the whereabouts of the father she'd thought dead, and Godot because of an ominous masked Harmonian bishop's obsessive hunt for the true rune of fire and because he wanted to see an old friend. However, it turns out that the Flame Champion has been dead for years, having relinquished his true rune, which conferred immortality, in order to live out a mortal life with the woman he loved. From here, the player gets to decide which of the three main characters inherit the true fire rune. I went with Hugo because he felt like the most natural choice. Whoever you choose, the plot swiftly shifts from an apparent Harmonian invasion to the Masked Bishop's plan to steal the elemental true runes for his own ends. But who could this masked figure possibly be? There are so many powerful mages in the setting dressed all in green that it could- It's Luke. It's Luke. It's so fucking obviously Luke that I don't get the point of disguising him. Here's his picture. <laughs> he doesn't look so tough. This is the kind of reveal that really only exists for the audience's sake and not the characters. There's about four returning characters from the previous two games who could have reasonably recognized Luke, and he'd have no reason to believe they'd even be in the area, much less working for people trying to stop him. Not to mention that all they'd remember of him is being the arrogant little shit Lechnot dropped off to show the hero the tablet that keeps track of how many stars of destiny he's collected. I suppose you could argue that he wore the mask to hide himself from Saucerai? But how stupid would he have to be to not recognize Luke when all he's done to disguise himself is wear a faceplate that barely even hides his face? And Luke's motivation for his heel turn? He's been getting visions of a bad future his whole life, so he's gonna blow up the grasslands with the power of the elemental true runes and kill God in a mass murder-suicide. Something something destiny, something something liberating mankind. And the best argument his slavishly devoted girlfriend can mount in defense of his plan to murder tens or hundreds of thousands because of a possible future and a plan that he has no guarantee will actually work is, Well, you've killed people too! That is just fucking stupid! As we all know, a soldier killing people in combat is exactly the same as killing tons of people because you're too much of a cowardly little shit to die alone. Congratulations, Sarah, you've reached the intellectual capacity of the average Twitter user. Oh, but it all gets explained if you recruit every possible character, thereby unlocking a playable epilogue where you see everything from Luke's point of view. I hit my breaking point when it explained away Boris's rampage by Sarah projecting an anger field around the village. A fucking anger field. All because the writers didn't want to resolve the plot point they wrote of a party member committing an atrocity. Just have him say he feels bad a couple times, reveal that the anger field made him do it, and everything's A-OK. -okay. Oh wait, the other knights never learned this fact. They just forgive him for being a war criminal because they're buds. Way to completely undermine one of the strongest points in your story that hooked me in the first place. Who wants to see a story where characters who genuinely uphold chivalric ideals come into conflict with a knight who behaves closer to what knights were truly like in history? You raised my hopes and dashed them quite expertly, sir. Bravo! As for the rest of that epilogue, while I normally play the games I cover to completion, I gave up shortly after the anger field and just read a recap online. What a bitch. Unprofessional, yes. But if after dragging me along the railroad for the vast majority of those 50 hours, Sui Koden 3 hides away all the context and depth of its main villain in post-game content, it clearly considers this to be about as important to the story as I do. It's a cliché to say I wanted to like this game so badly, but it's true. 
I genuinely went into Sui Koden 3 with the expectation that I'd wind up enjoying myself despite its divisive status. It wouldn't be the first time that's happened. Hell, I did a Final Fantasy VIII video where I gave a pretty spirited defense of Squall as a character. My problems with Sui Koden 3 aren't exactly with what it is, but more with what it isn't. That being a good Sui Koden game. On the surface, nothing is outright broken or disgustingly bad in Sui Koden 3. It's not hard to see how anyone unfamiliar with the series could find a lot to enjoy here. For an outsider, it's a unique blend of genres that you'd struggle to find elsewhere, combined with the novelty of multiple protagonists, and an interesting story for the most part, even if it winds up building to a rather cliched climax. An 8 out of 10 if I used review scores. But I've played what came before. I know what a good Sui Koden is, and Sui Koden 3 is a pale imitation of that. The best elements of the first two games have been stripped down or replaced entirely with nothing but lazy railroading and cheap padding in their place. I told myself over and over again as I played, just give it time, it'll open up like the first two did and show what it's really got. 30 hours to get there is patently ridiculous. Yes, getting access to the theater minigame at long last is a fun diversion, but you know why I didn't bring it up earlier when talking about the gameplay? A single minigame that provides a few sensible chuckles doesn't begin to make up for making me walk back and forth across the same handful of locations for 30 hours, conjuring up bad memories of Final Fantasy XIII all the while. What makes this all the more frustrating to me is how strong Sui Koden 3 starts off. One of the best opening FMVs on the whole system, followed by what initially seems to be a tragic tale about the suffering brought about by war, only to trip down the stairs and land flat on its face when it tries to pivot to a far less interesting storyline. I need to emphasize again how close I was to saying that the story made up for all of Sui Koden 3's flaws before this happened. Even if I likely would have still seen it as weaker than its predecessors, it was so damn close to being worth a look on its own merits. If I hadn't committed to doing every Sui Koden title, I doubt I would have made this video at all. I don't like covering games I dislike for the same reason I deliberately avoided boob jokes in my Tomb Raider video. Come on, man! That's too easy! Getting pissed off at a video game is so standard it may as well be the default state of being on YouTube. I've dropped a number of games I planned on doing because I couldn't find a way to enjoy them, or failing that, present them in an interesting way. Hopefully I was able to at least achieve the latter with this video. If not, well I appreciate you hearing me out at least to this point before piecing out. Feels weird to add anything after that, but I don't know where else to put this. I've been running myself ragged to get the last few videos done in a reasonable time frame, and I feel like I'm on the verge of burning myself out. To keep that burnout from happening, I'm going to be taking some time off to relax and recharge my batteries. It won't be for too long, though. You can look forward to my next video on August 13th. I'll see you then. Did I ever tell you my dad's last words to me? Mm -hmm. Careful, son. I don't think the safety's on. Before that!